right now we're joined by Mary House with the uh, Yes on the Initiative 1351 campaign. We're going to tell us about it. So go ahead with the five minute introduction. Great, thanks. I really appreciate being here with the 36 District Democrats. My name is Mary House. I'm the parent of four boys in Washington Public Schools. I'm a former classroom teacher in Washington, and I am the proud sponsor of Initiative 1351. Um, I'm so proud to sponsor this because I think it's time to send a message that we need to fund our schools and we need to reduce class sizes for every Washington child. We've received great support from our allies in labor, the PTA, and uh, Washington State Democrats. So thank you for um, that support. And of course, um, I'd like to ask for your formal endorsement today. Um, why is 1351 so important for our schools? I think because you know, and teachers know, and parents know, that no matter where you live, or the color of your skin, or your economic background, um, or the language you speak, every child in Washington deserves an education in a classroom where a teacher can spend time working with every single student. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but right now Washington ranks 47th in the nation in class size. So that, put another way, we crowd more students in a classroom than all but three states. Um, I think that's not how I see Washington. I hope it's not how you see Washington. I think of our state as a place that is, uh, prides itself on innovation and that we pride ourselves on our schools and what we do for children. So I'd like to change it and not have us continue to rank so low in class size. What 47th in the nation looks like um, is that it's not uncommon to have kindergarten students in a classroom where they're trying to learn the most basic skills letters, their numbers, how to um, begin reading and doing some really important basic social skills, they might be in a room with 30 students and one teacher. It's not uncommon. Uh, I personally have nightmares about being in a room with 35 year olds and that has nothing to do with teaching. It's just that's a, that's a tough age and that's really hard to manage, but that's pretty common in our state. It means that we have um, high schoolers and middle schoolers in science labs that are built for 24 and there may be 32 students in that class, so they're trying to share equipment or take their turn conducting experiments in labs. And it's not really uncommon for uh, high school students to be in an advanced math class or uh, out, you know, any kind of class, and there still could be 30 or more students. I just don't think we can expect kids to learn or really compete in a global economy in that environment. I mean, common sense tells us that that's just not the right situation for our students. And there's great research to back that up as well. What Initiative 1351 would do is it would reduce class sizes in grades K through 3 to down to uh, 17 students, and in grades 4 through 12 down to 25 students. I don't know if those numbers sound fine in the sky to you, but they actually would make us about average in the nation. So we've gotten pretty um, comfortable with this idea that students can be in class sizes much higher, and if we were successful, our proposal would actually just make us average in the nation instead of 47. In fact, 1351 doesn't really do anything more than the, uh, force the state to reduce class sizes by their own bipartisan recommendations. These numbers come from the QVC recommendations. That's where we come up with uh, those recommendations. We can make up these numbers. And we're just asking the state to do what they recommended to have effective education in our state. Um, so I think that um, while we've had great support from Democrats in the legislature, we do think that it's time to take this to the vote of the people. Um, and we think that's necessary to make progress. So I thank you for your time. And I hope that you can support class size reduction for every child in Washington schools. Thank you. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. Mary, go ahead. Um, first question, I, I have a couple. Um, I understand that an initiative that the legislature has to do what is called for for two years and then they can vote to drop it. And, and I believe that's what happened to a class size initiative, I don't know, 15 years ago? don't know exactly how long. Um, but the funding is not included in your initiative. And so, with everything else that is going on, um, I 
was a teacher for 40 years. I had one year with 36 kids in each of my five classes. I sat a kid at my desk one year so that I could honestly tell the counselor there is not another seat in this room. I've dealt with it. <clears throat> and I'm not against anything you say. But as a practical matter, we have the McCleary decision. We have pressure on, I mean, the legislature has worked so hard to find a way to bring the money for the McCleary decision without doing any new revenue, which I think most of us probably agree is impossible. But they may try to do that again. So teachers' pensions are in danger. Um, I suppose firemen and policemen pensions too. They'll be looking everywhere they can for money. And this just puts more pressure on it. So why now? Right. So why don't we do four minutes, say or two questions. Yeah. One, <laughs> so I think first is, what's, well, the, just, what's, what's the effect of the initiative, yeah, the two-year thing, the funding thing? And number two is, how does this compete with McCleary and other things? Okay. So um, in terms of, you meant you were asked, you know, is it possible for the legislature to undo this in two years? Um, it is possible if, mm -hmm. if they pass majority, and you spoke about 728, which reduced class sizes and has been eliminated. So, I mean, when we talk about affordability, I think it's important to remember that the state has continued to cut and underfund education. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so as far as why now, um, we believe this is an essential part of fully funding schools. And McCleary is about fully funding schools. And um, it was part of that, that case where the state argued that they had a plan, and this plan included their class size reductions and these numbers that I mentioned, and it still hasn't happened. So as far as why now, we think this, this goes hand in hand with McCleary. It's an important step towards meeting McCleary, and that um, we, our children continue to wait for the state to figure out how to fund this. This mandates funding for education in a way that parents and students feel and understand and value. Follow up a bit. Um, I'm concerned about impact on social services for one thing, and I'm also concerned about impact on districts like Seattle, mm -hmm. where we're pretty close to having no place to put more teachers and you know kids in smaller classes that you need more classrooms. Uh, any comment on those? Sure. I, um, again, I heard two questions in terms of you know. I, I too, I mean, what we're talking about is trying to help kids who need help and need services, and this initiative prioritizes high poverty schools first. So I don't disagree with you that we need those social services, but I also think that we cannot only provide social services and never help kids rise out of poverty because we haven't provided them with an adequate education. So I, I think we have to do better as a state, and I think that this is part of that plan. Um, you bring up a really good point about capacity, and there are places, especially in Seattle, that simply do not have the physical space. One, proponent, one part of this initiative that I think is important is that even if you don't have the physical space, you still would get the funding for staff to work directly with students. And so that means that until, you know, we'll still need to address the building issue, but what's really important is getting adults working with children. So we would still get that adult help. So it might mean two teachers in a classroom, which um, isn't ideal, but it's better than the current situation. Or um, you know, there's lots of creative ways to address that, but um, I don't dispute that we do need to deal with the building issue um, as a next step. I think it's a difficult, though, to get people to want to build more buildings and classrooms until we show them that we have the staff there to work with students and reduce class sizes. Thank you. Um, my question is similar to hers in terms of capacity. Sounds like to get these ratios down, you're going to hire more teachers. Is there any uh, support from the schools that are bringing up teachers, Seattle University, UW, et cetera, to be producing more educators to fill this need? And I realize in Seattle there's a very large demand for teachers. It's also a hard city. It, the city is hard to, um, for teachers to find employment. And at the same time, as a state, I realize it's, it's broader and it's, it's up and down, depending on where you go. But have you had cooperation from education schools? 
Uh, we haven't pursued that, but again, going back to uh, Mary's, is it Mary? yes. Mary's point earlier, we've actually, we're, we've actually cut class size funding, and we actually have quite a big pool of educators that have been cut over the years. So I don't know that, you know, while we need to have more and more educators, I don't think we're at a point where this is, there's a shortage. The other thing to remember is this is phased in gradually over five years, so it does give that time. I hope we're successful, and I think that's a great suggestion that we do work with the universities to make sure that we are, um, you know, driving people to the profession and, and um, filling these positions with quality candidates. John? So I'm not a teacher, <laughs> but I do know something about research. You did mention there were studies that, that showed the class size of it does make a big difference yes. because and when you talked about the, the absolute numbers of number 30, 47 versus number one, I, I don't get a good feeling yet in terms of what's the absolute difference in class size from number one to number 50. That's part of the question. And, and what does the research actually say? Because it, you know, it, it sounds to me like there's a difference of three to five kids, like Mary is saying she had 36 versus 30 versus 25. Where do we know? Is, is there is there really a, a cutoff that 25? They can show that. The sweet spot. But again, yeah, I understand. I, I I absolutely cannot cover all the research in two minutes. So one thing I want to do is refer you to our, our website, which has more information. Now I should have set it up. On but no, that's okay. So it is there. But your question is still good. I mean, the research is very compelling, and what it what is interesting. To, to get to the point of your question is that any class size reduction has been shown as effective, that there isn't necessarily a sweet spot, but even one less or two less, the, there's, there are benefits there. Um, you know, you get to obviously a more reasonable number and you're going to have better connections with kids, more relationships, or just speaking to one parent and put it this way, you know, how many eight-year-olds would you have over to your house for a birthday party? I don't need research to tell me that I would not have 30. Um, I can't, you know, manage and interact with that many children effectively. So, um, but please go to our website because the research and the links are there. But what's encouraging is that any reduction would be effective. And then back to your point about 47 in the nation, um, again, we're, it's pretty common here to have students in classes, you know, in the 20s and 30s. We would be 17 K-3, 25, 4 through 12, and that's average in the nation. So it's, part of this is about being competitive in a global economy with students from other states. So number one, one through five, the, the top five in, in, in ideal class size, what numbers are we talking about for those I'm sorry, states? I'm, oh, what numbers the are we The top five states, what, what kind of class sizes do they have? You know, I don't have, I mean, exact numbers, but I'd have to, I'd have to look and see what their, their ratios are. But again, 17 and 25 make us average, so we'd have to be lower than that. And I'm sorry, off the top of my head, I just don't know what Exactly. Probably find them on your website. Yeah, probably find them on the website. Yeah. Uh, um, so it sounds like this is being man you want this to be mandated in the state coming into law. Is there are there other states where this is mandated? Or is it just when you're talking about average, I know I happen to know Connecticut has a really low class size. Right. And it's one of the better education states in the country. Do they have a mandate saying you can only have as many as 15 kids in K through three? And, and how have they instituted? How long has that been instituted? And what is again? What is the research showing on it? And I get it because you can't answer it. But do you know all of it? Do you know states that actually do have it mandated as long? I don't know for certain. I think I I suspect there are. But to be honest with you, I don't can't give an example and say this is the mandate. And this is what the limit is, um, but I know that other states have um, have done things. I, I'm not sure how they got there, but we get compared a lot to to Massachusetts. We have about the same number of students and and, um, and so forth, but they have um, you know far more teachers per student, and they perform really well. So we can look at other states to compare. I just I apologize, I don't have an exact laws in hand of how they got there. I guess sort of a technical question, mm -hmm. or sort of a legal question, I'm a lawyer, but uh, so I want to McCleary, my understanding, and I haven't read it carefully, but my understanding is McCleary 
basically tells the legislature, you have to find what you already passed as law as what defines the paramount duty. The legislature passed its definition of what paramount duty is and then failed to meet it, and now the court is saying that. I'm wondering how this initiative, what it mandates, how that compares to the class size content of that definition of the legislature passed. I guess if, if part of the critique is this binds the legislature somewhat in meeting the query, how much does it bind or how much does it shift that definition? So I am not an attorney, but really what is the essence of the query was that the state was found not to be meeting its paramount duty, which is to fully fund education. And so I think one of the uh, misconceptions out there is that that somehow um, generated a decision that's a list of items they must do and price tags next to them. Whereas the bottom line was just the decision that the state is not fully funding and that they need to by 2018. And during that court case, there were lots of plans brought up that the state had, and I referred to those. And one of them was that they had a um, bipartisan quality education council come up with a prototypical school model and make recommendations for staff. Those recommendations are what we put in this initiative, but they have not implemented those and they have not funded those. So really, um, this is an essential part of McCleary. It's not something different. It's not, we're not introducing numbers or concepts that were not already part of that. And then again, just kind of getting down to common sense, I think if the state were fully funding education, we would not be 47th in a nation in class size. We would just, that just wouldn't exist. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Right, right. Um, <laughs> it's probably the last question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the class size is certainly part of McCleary, but there's other things with McCleary, and, and so there is a change in that the initiative would focus on that one thing. And I still think that one of the ways the legislature does money or something they can't get out of doing is that they take it from other programs. And I'm thinking of all the social services and all the other functions of state government. And it just seems like this is going to make a bad situation worse uh, in the pressure that it puts on the legislature. Um, do you have any additional response to that? <laughs> well, I think that, um, I think it creates a good pressure. I think that um, you know we have waited a long time for the state to deal with education funding, and it just hasn't. And so uh, you know I don't disagree that this will make things difficult and that we will have to um, address this. But it's an opportunity to do something positive for students instead of continuing to say we don't know. It's just too hard. And, and finally say, let's take some control of this and do what's right for, for students and, um, and move forward. So I, I think it's a really good opportunity to break that gridlock and to stop um, delaying the funding and to really, um, yeah, on an issue that I think people understand, they know it's, it's common sense and we should, we should do this. So I think it's actually a great opportunity to do something that um, that forces these good discussions and these good problems in a way that's meaningful to students and parents. Okay, so we're about out of time. Do you want to take maybe just 30 seconds to make a closing comment? Okay. Well, again, and we'd love to um, have your support. Um, I think this is um, I think this is at the heart of what Democrats believe, providing uh, quality education for every student in their state. I hope you agree, and I uh, really appreciate the time today. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. you.